Good afternoon, everyone. It's Lisa Norell, and it is Friday, November 20th. I had to look down for a minute and say, what date is it? Oh, yes, it's COVID date, right? It's November 20th, 2020, and I'm really happy to be with you today. As you know, this is our weekly Mindful Marketer live stream. We broadcast concurrently across LinkedIn, live, Facebook Live, YouTube, and who knows where else. Look out, Ted Turner. Anyway, we're happy that you're here. And this is our third in a series of life streams where we really unpack what it means to be a purpose-driven marketer. So I'm very pleased that you put some time aside this Friday afternoon to be with us and to learn from another master in the area of purpose-driven marketing, Nancy Ruder. She'll be joining us shortly. I also really enjoy it when we get lots of good questions and comments from our community. So be sure to post any of your questions here and we'll take as many as we can handle. We'll be here for the next 40 minutes or so. Now let's before I introduce our guest, uh, let's also talk for a minute about why people have been asking me about this. As you know, I host private forums for chief marketing officers and also advise and coach a number of C-suite executives. And I can tell you at a wholesale level, the majority of them have been experiencing either a personal or an organization-wide existential crisis. So I just wrote about this in my newsletter that it actually is one of the silver linings of COVID because it is forcing so many of us to ask what really matters to us? What do we stand for? How can we make money and do things that make us really proud? This is the time to be asking those questions. And in fact, I have talked about this in the last session where uh, we taught, I actually showed you something called the innovation, the purpose trifecta, which is really a, a three part journey that I see my clients go through where they first have to define for their teams and their stakeholders, what is purpose? What does that really mean? And then how do we design the messaging and the positioning so that it supports that new and renewed purpose? And then most importantly, how do we deploy it? How do we implement it? So it goes from installation to implementation, from what I call compliance to commitment. Because if you don't have deployment, what you have is what I call FOM. So in this Venn diagram, you'll see the term FOM, which stands for flavor of the month, which is the kiss of death for any leader to be known as the flavor of the month leader. So we're going to be diving further into this and and really understanding uh, what is behind this. How do we create an ongoing conversation and a new way of operating through our purpose. So without too much further ado, let me introduce our special guest. Nancy Ruder is the CEO of Noetic Consultants in Maryland, United States. And she's also the author of Jack and Jill Went Up the Hill, How Senior Marketers Scale the Heights. Nancy, welcome to the live stream. Thank you, happy to be here. Yeah, it's great to see you this Friday. How are you holding up from the elections, the pandemic? Yeah, you know, I've, a long year. A, I've decided to take a, a momentary break from my existential crisis to be here with you today. <laughs> <laughs> no, I totally agree that um, nobody nobody is exempt from feeling that completely. But but today is Friday, so it's a good day, and I am thrilled to be here with you. I'm especially thrilled that I'm here on this topic because it's one I'm very passionate about. Well, you started your firm over 15 years ago, right? It's been it's been yeah, a while. I started it when I was 12. That's right. I know. I know. <laughs> I, I got that right. I, I can do the math. Uh, and you did it because you had a purpose in mind too, right? I mean, it, you weren't just creating some company just to make money. Correct. 
I actually, the impetus for me was a, a geographical move. I moved to the Washington DC area and the, the opportunity in that was that it was not a big marketing town. So I saw an opportunity to really do brand work that would help organizations and people really understand how they can define their brands for the first time, redefine them, refine them, strengthen them in some capacity. Um, I thought that perhaps our work would be more in the region, but what I found pretty quickly is that our, our work really hasn't been very <laughs> geographically based. So even though we're in DC, we could, we could probably be anywhere. But that focus was a gift really because that is my personal passion. And then I was able to bring that into a company so that I was able to create. So I'm very, I feel very blessed. Well, the purpose of your firm too goes beyond just some deliverable of a new and refreshed brand or positioning for your clients. It seems like you're also looking to improve the brand, the positioning and the mindset of the people behind the brand. I, and you have that in your tagline on your website for yeah. Noetic Consultants. What, what, What's behind that? Yes, we often talk about strengthening brands and the people who build those brands. And what underlies that is that really a brand is a living, breathing, organic thing unto itself, certainly, but it's built by the people who are caring for it or not caring for it, depending upon what may be going on. And so if you can equip the people, we often talk about educating, inspiring, and equipping people. So it's not just about people knowing what to do, but they really need to want to do it and then have the right tools and resources and know how to be able to do it. So if you have people doing that inside the house, you will be able to be the, the strongest brand outside the house. And the part that people often fall down on more so than the definition of the brand is the deployment of the brand, getting it really strong inside, equipping it inside so that it can be its strongest expression outside. It's it's easy to say, and it's it's very hard to do because it's a day in, day out, pay attention to the details kind of a job. Okay, so are you suggesting that all of these very fancy, and some of my best friends run agencies, so um, I'm probably gonna poke and provoke somebody because I usually offend at least one person in these live streams, but I know, I, are you saying that agencies are not trained or schooled in change management? Hmm. Well, maybe. <laughs> really, you know, when you think about it, the what agencies are often doing is taking what is in existence and making it better and amplifying it. And that's all... That's great. That's a very important component because if you can't get it out in the world and inspire the external world, then you're just an idea, you know, that's sitting maybe on a piece of paper inside a drawer. But the part that I'm speaking of is the part that really needs to come before that. And that has to do with the people who are part of that organization, who every day get up and go to work, whether that's now in their basement, their bedroom, an actual office, who understand and are bought in and inspired by the idea of what that company is offering and standing for. And if you have that, you will have that ability, you know, then you can get all the help in the world to amplify it out in the world. But if you don't have that understanding and buy-in from your own people, it, it, the disconnect is there and it will show its light in some capacity. Right. And so how many times have you witnessed organizations that got all of the right messaging or there's tribal knowledge around this new and refreshed purpose, but it falls short on implementation? Yes, often. <laughs> and one of the biggest mistakes actually is that it um, it's that expression that uh, you often hear parents say, you know, do as I say, but not as I do. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that telling their kids not to do this or that, you know, don't, don't eat in front of the TV, but there they are, you know, doing it. Um, that, that is, that is the number one thing that we see that is short-sighted. It's this idea of, you know, here's, here's what we stand for. 
here's our purpose, who we, here's who we are as a brand. Maybe it's on the website, maybe it's talked about in the annual report, perhaps it's making it, its way into the CEO's town halls, but in the day to day, it's, it's not happening. It, it's not rooted, it's not taking place in people's behaviors. And we're still in, in a true do what I say and not what I do, the opposite may be happening. So you're a brand that says that, you know, you're standing for um, deep collaboration. And if you have a free agent type of culture, don't think people don't notice. <laughs> just, I know. I just love what you put up here because you found that there were three very common mistakes or places that the deployment of a new purpose can fall short. Um, you mentioned the first one about eating in front of the TV. I got that one. Um, talk not to that the there's way. anything wrong with that. It's just if you're telling your kids not to do it and then you're doing it, that, that that's the problem. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so these are the three, you know, that we see most commonly. I would say one that's not on the page is, you know, not defining your purpose and your brand at all. But that's sort of perhaps an obvious one, like don't skip that. But even if you have defined it, um, yes, then not not pulling that through into the organization. The second one, you know, can be very tricky. So when you have some kind of a disconnect, or maybe you end up having, um, you know, an issue with quality, and you stand for high quality, you have um, something that comes out in the press that flies in the face of what you're trying to stand for. It really needs to be acknowledged, owned, and fixed to the best of your ability. And we do see some brands do this, and we see other brands who try to just sort of put it over there or not not do enough to acknowledge it. If you acknowledge it and you're working to fix it, your customers will respect you for that because everybody realizes that mistakes will get made. And, and the third one um, really is around just setting it and forgetting it. So you put it on your website, put it in your annual report, maybe it's in the CEO's remarks, but really there's no overt effort in pulling it through. When we do stakeholder interviews, which we often do in our engagements, and when we are defining or refining or refreshing whatever we're doing with with the brand and or the purpose we'll ask people um individually across a bunch of people what what does your company stand for what does your brand stand for and we're looking to see one do they know <laughs> can they articulate it do people articulate it using common language and phrasing and then as importantly maybe more importantly how do they say it so you would be amazed how many times you'll have somebody say, well, we, uh, you know, it here it's like, it's all about high quality. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's sort of this, this discomfort of this is what I think we say we're supposed to be, but they don't feel it in their heart. And you can tell when people, um, sometimes they just plain don't know sometimes they're telling you with skepticism or even a little bit of bewilderment but what we want to see of course is people who are able to articulate it they don't have to use the same exact words but if they articulate it and they're animated and you can tell that they feel it in their heart that is when you know that you have equipped inside the house yeah that's that's a very very good point and i also want to remind everybody who's watching to Put something in the comments for us. Tell us where you're from. And uh, we would love to welcome you and take any of your questions as we go along here. You know, the other thing that must be a challenge when you're working with clients, we're going to hear some of the things you have done with companies and some of your favorite examples. Um, it must be tough for you as well when you're working with clients because when you're, you're helping them galvanize their teams they're dealing with humans and humans you know we're a bit of a paradox because on the one hand we want to really show everybody how we're unique but on the other hand we also want to belong we want to feel like we're part of something bigger than so ourselves so how do you allow for for that paradox to coexist yeah, it's, it's an excellent point. If you want people to be bought into something, they want to have a say 
and they also need to be a part of that that broader whole. So, um, so a, a small thing and a big thing. In all of our work, we do a lot of interactive workshops. And one of the key reasons we do that is to care for exactly what you're talking about, which is that individualism as well as needing to be part of the collective whole. So we always say to clients, um, who should join this session? And we need people who are gonna bring really good thinking. So we want some of your best thinkers and we want people who are gonna have individualistic thoughts that we need in the boat because that way you 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 know get them talking so that's just a small thing but i think a very important thing when you're trying to get people aligned give it room for them to have a voice but generally speaking when you're talking about trying to deploy um, and affect your purpose and your brand across your organization your people is one of the biggest tools you have your messiest tools but one of your biggest tools and if you can really involve them in that shaping. So get them on board with the foundation of what you're trying to build, but then let them take it and run with it. As long as everyone is singing off the same song sheet, as they say, you can have people be creative with it. You don't necessarily have to you know, dictate all of the things that are happening at every level. And in fact, it's easier that way, right? Because if people are all on board, think of the power behind that, that any one individual can take that and do really fascinating things. And we, we all have a platform today with social media, especially. And so if people are taking that brand into the world themselves, aligned against what you're really trying to do, you've got tremendous power there. We have someone from LinkedIn who I hope you'll tell us where you're from. This is one, I, you know, I'm part of the LinkedIn beta program. So it's they haven't worked out all the kinks yet. We'll see LinkedIn user. <laughs> so, you know, last week we had Mark Levy as our guest and Mark said, well, how do you not know that their last name is user? So hello, <laughs> Mr. or Mrs. I say that, that was really good. So purpose-driven brands are what organizations live and breathe. What are some memorable examples of organizations who are living their brands? Yeah. So, and on this, you know, people are, people are messy um, aspect and how do you, how do you take that and embrace that? So one of my favorite examples is Travel Channel. And this goes back a few years, but it was just a stellar example of a company that embraced their purpose and who they were as a brand. So they were, they had been spun off from Discovery. Um, they were now owned by Cox. They had an opportunity to really be a standalone brand for the first time, not part of a large portfolio where they a little bit had to take a number in the Discovery world. And so their purpose was around infusing passion for travel in in all that they do. So once they got it defined and they had, you know, their brand guide, they refreshed their website, they were infusing it into their programming. What they did with their people is a series of interactive workshops, 15 people max for the whole company. And we helped them deploy this. And in those workshops, the primary thing we talked about were people's passionate travel experiences. I still remember a lot of those stories. There was laughter, there was tears, there was uh, hairs on the back of your neck standing up, listening to people talk about their passion experiences and you watched people get it and you watched people get not just educated, right, but inspired and equipped to take it. Then we helped them create a committee. They called it the bug committee. It stood for travel bug. <laughs> oh, I like that. The bug, but not like software bugs. No. No, travel no, bugs. A good bug, and this was pre-corona, so it was okay to talk about bugs. <laughs> so that committee actually quarterly rotated. So people went on the committee, and it was their job to be the ambassadors. They had a modest budget to work with, and they were set free to create programs within the organization that would further the purpose and the meaning of the brand. It was so popular that we thought it was just going to be a group of people that would kind of carry on maybe for a year. We ended up rotating who was on the bug committee quarterly because people were clamoring to be on the bug committee. And they did so many different things. Lisa, they created videos, they ran events, they had all charitable donations. They had all different ways that they were expressing it. And it was for the people and by the people. 
And importantly, they also had an internal platform that they set up where they shared traction and results. So they were being transparent back to the organization about what had been accomplished, which is a really important part too, to keep yourself honest about what you're doing so you don't end up, what is it, FOM. Yeah, flavor of the month. Nobody wants that. Flavor of the month. And I also have some more questions. Quickly, I want to welcome Joyce from San Antonio. We have Michael from Atlanta. We have Annette from San Diego. I think, I, I'm not sure if we have anybody from the Northeast corner of the US, but um, looks like we're covering our ground this nice, week. Nice. So we have a number of people checking in with me here. And so talk to me about metrics and success. So tell me what kinds of metrics the bug committee was reporting back, because clearly it must have worked for them to keep getting funding to fuel yeah. this, this uh, purpose. Absolutely. So ideally, and, and at a practical level, if you have some sort of a metrics dashboard that you're already doing, the first question to ask yourself is how can we infuse, do we need to add a couple metrics to what we're already doing? But if you don't have something like that, and you're thinking about it from the start, think first about internal engagement. If you get really strong internal engagement, people are clear they feel equipped, they feel inspired. So you can do a series of questions and do a quarterly pulse to see how people are feeling about it. As you think about external though, and, and certainly for bigger organizations, many now are becoming quite transparent about where they are on their key initiatives. The biggest example, and I'm going big here, is Procter & Gamble, who is doing a massive diversity push and to show transparently and honestly where they are, they give themselves this metric. And I think they use, you know, red, yellow, green, and it kind of looks like a fuel tank kind of thing. And that honesty about where you're not there yet is as important as showing that traction and progress. But so on the big end of the scale, it's really good to be truly transparent. And it's the kind of thing that you may want to promote out to your shareholders, to your customers. But if you're starting from scratch on this, start with an internal engagement study and track your progress over time of how people feel. Are they clear? Are they inspired? Do they feel equipped? About yeah, that's great. That's great. There are so many software products out there that can help with that as well. I have interviewed David Hassel in the past. He's the CEO of a San Francisco company called 15.5. Not David yeah. Hasselhoff. Not David Hasselhoff. No, I've never seen his watch if board summit. Him, if you if you get him, if I can just come back as a side guest, though. I, I promise. I'll just sit in the green room. I I, I should interview a lifeguard. I have swum. I have swum in enough oceans across the planet. Hundred percent. That I need a probably a boat captain and a lifeguard would be I think really you do. good. And I think that that might be a key action step out of this live stream for you today. I, I'm i on it, I'm on it. <laughs> All right, but you know, my to-do list is getting very heavy here for the- Yeah, interview. but you might wanna put that one right at the top. <laughs> okay. It'll help with the existential issues. I but totally agree, <laughs> uh, absolutely out the window. Let's also get, we have a question from Annette in San Diego. How long do you help clients on their journey when their walk is not matching their talk? Can you share some journeys that are effective and maybe not so effective? Yeah. Oh, Annette. Yeah. It, it's difficult to put a specific time constraint on how long it takes because the journey is never done. So I don't say that to be depressing, but the journey needs to be an ongoing journey and it's going to be, it's going to be a chip away. And it's the kind of thing that you want to make sure you are caring for, you know, over the long haul. But as you would embark on something, um, you should be able to see significant improvement within a quarter if you're really dedicated to it, if you can get it defined and you can get it deployed and you really get people behind it. And as far as the external marketplace, certainly within a year, you should be seeing that traction in a different kind of way because it should be infusing into all the different activity that that you're doing again going back to the mistakes or the blind spots that we talked about a few minutes ago um, 
there are companies out there that don't have that kind of discipline or appetite to to do it. And and I would say one of the most difficult parts of that can be leadership changes. So when you have, you know, a C-suite that is pushing against a certain way of doing things and then you have big turnover, that is where we see the most traction oftentimes can get lost. And that can be um, a bit disheartening and sometimes a little scary for, for some companies when the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. Yes, that, that is a shame when that happens. And there is quite a bit of turmoil going on. It's been a big year for IPOs. It's a big year for reorganizations in the middle of COVID. So unfortunately, we probably do witness some of that happening at warp speed right now. I will also, I'd like to get back to you for a moment, Annette, and tell you that I actually did advise the general manager of a company in California for some time. And the general manager was trying to really amplify their purpose. It was a software company and worked with them for some time to make sure that they aligned their teams around their common marketing and sales purpose and activities. So I was coaching a number of their executives. And I can tell you, Annette, that they did not have their walk matching their talk. So what would happen was they would um, they would work with the local business journal and get all of these awards for best places to work. Employees are our greatest asset. Okay, fine. However, what was happening was the CEO and the CFO, for some reason, had special parking spots dedicated just mm -hmm. to them. Now, neither of them were disabled, but for some reason, they had the best parking spots reserved for them in the front of the building. They were eating in front of the TV when they- They were eating in front, thank you. They were eating in front of the TV. And um, I always wondered, you know, why is that? And the other part, it was a very animal farm culture because all pigs were created equal, except some pigs were more equal than others. And it, the other example to watch out for, especially in a growth organization is, are the pigs in, and I say pigs with all due respect, okay? No pigs were harmed in the production of this live stream, but the yeah, the <laughs> they had the pigs in the sales department were much more equal than the pigs in marketing or the pigs in HR or the pigs in finance. So what happened was you had that, you know, you had too many different strata of, of authority and decision making and their purpose was not really taken too seriously. I'll tell you a quick example on, on the flip side. Um, one company that has just done extraordinary things in many have um, one company, such company, 7-Eleven. And, you know, we all know 7-Eleven. It's like it's on the corner. Right. But but 7-Eleven is about making positive community impact and helping people get what they want and need when and where they want and need it. So it's it convenience taken to a whole different level. One of the things in COVID early on was that they have an owner operator model. And the CEO and the CEO and his senior executives went to town on helping these owner operators figure out how to stand up their businesses, PPP and all the other aspects that they had to reimagine. And they have done many external things that you may have seen press about. They've done pop-up stores so that healthcare workers can get on-site things that they need on the fly. They have leaned in much more deeply to their partnership with Feeding America, Feeding the Hungry. But this effort behind the scenes that they did, that you know they have not promoted, in my humble opinion, is one of the most powerful things that they did in living their purpose. And it cures for exactly what you're talking about, Lisa, because the C-suite folks, quite frankly, were like, oh, this is what we're doing. Like, we're going to get on the phone with all the owner operators. And in so doing, not only did they come to more deeply understand the entrepreneurial spirit and drive and challenges that these people had, but they also saw their CEO fighting for these people. 
Wow. So that's the kind of thing that, you know, it, you have to have an appetite to really do it, like really do it. So if you're, if you've determined who you are as a brand clearly, and it really is authentically true, then you're golden because then all you have to do is just live it every day. But if you really are just kind of superimposing something and saying like, that sounds pretty good. Let's go with that one. Check the box. Yeah. Let's just check the box. It's not going to work out so well. No, no, exactly. And those are some great examples because they are different industries. Do you, how much do you think this also can apply to a B2B company? Many of our viewers are from B2B companies and are working on, you know, sizable contracts and opportunities with other organizations. Yeah, hundred percent. I think it does. We work with a lot of B2B over the years. Increasingly, we've been working with B2B at the end of the day, um, the B is made up of a bunch of H, you know, humans. So we often say, you know, it's not really B to B to B or B to C. It's it's B to human, B to H. At the end of the day, it is it is about people. So even when you're serving commercial organizations, you're still serving people who want to understand who you are, what you're really about, and how that's going to drive your actions. And particularly when you're running a business and you're trying to do some sort of a partnership, engage in purchasing services or goods, you want to know what you're going to get. That's like one of the biggest concerns, right? I'm, I'm going to align with you. I'm going to make this commitment with you. What am I going to get over time? Like, I know what you're telling me now, you know, initially, great, we signed the deal. But like, what about months from now, years from now? And that's where purpose and brand really come into play that you do what you say you're going to do and you keep doing it. The consistency is key. And as Drew from DC is telling us, I love the travel channel story to inspiring brand advocacy. I wish um, there was a little emoji for gold stars because Drew from DC has been attending 100% of our live streams. And it's amazing. We are still on speaking terms. It's all beautiful. <laughs> it's, great. it's great. So um, that is awesome. Yeah. Drew is awesome. I, I had the privilege of knowing Drew as well. Hi, Drew. Hey, Drew. Shout Hi, out to Drew. Drew. Yeah. And last week we had Robbie Baxter here. It was She was uh, sending us emojis and thumbs up. So it's it's nice that we have we have our uh, I'll say we have our regulars. Yeah, <laughs> that I do my best to promise something and then deliver on what I promise. Exactly what we were just talking that's, about. That's what we're trying. We're doing here. And um, I, I do wonder in a in, whether it's a B2B organization or it is a consumer goods company or retail, as we just talked about. What I'm this first two, this is a two part question. Number one, in your opinion, which department or function within an organization should take ownership of a purpose driven marketing initiative? You want to tell me part two? Or you... <laughs> um, that's part one. Well, the second would be if I'm a CMO or a CFO or a president, like which, whichever person or functional area that might be, how do I in, how do I know how much to invest in this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as far as um, who should take ownership, my n not flip answer is the CEO needs to take ownership. Not to say that the CEO needs to be in the day-to-day -day deployment. But if it doesn't start from the top, truly and authentically, people will know and it will hinder results, full stop. So initially as it's being developed, as well as in some sort of a meaningful pulse, the CEO needs to be the number one person who is in charge of that vision, brand, purpose. That said, from there, often you'll see it sitting in a marketing capability or a communication. Sometimes marketing and communications are, are together. I've seen it sit with a COO. Um, I haven't often seen it sit with finance, but I would welcome the day that it would because it would get more funding <laughs> if it did. Um, and so to, so it's, it's less important where it lives 
but more important that the people who are caring for it every day are deeply committed to it and have that ability to do that informal but powerful influencing throughout the rest of the organization, which is why I think the Travel Channel example is so powerful because it it democratized what was happening. And by the way, the CEO of Travel Channel attended one of those all day workshops and sat amongst the people and did the same exercises as everybody else, as did all the other C-suite people. So again, it's really about you need it from top down and, and bottom up. Level of investment, I always advise clients to think about that as a percentage of your overall investment. How much are you investing in your brand and your culture? Don't just look at it as your advertising, but what are you investing in all the ways that you're growing your overall brand and your culture? So that would involve dollars, ideally, that could be HR dollars, could be marketing dollars, could come from other parts of the organization. And if you're smaller, there are a lot of things that you can do that take time, but not money. A lot of, again, the examples that went on in, in travel were not very expensive things that they were doing. I mean, you know, creating videos, standing up an internal platform. Um, this took people's time, but it, it wasn't it wasn't a great investment of dollars. Well, that's a very good point. And now is the time to do bootstrapping. And we have so many tools and channels we can use that are reasonable, especially those in the SaaS arena. We have tools like TikTok and Instagram and others that do require care and feeding, but not massive investments. Right. And um, and that's the exciting part right now of what we're seeing. And we only have a few minutes left. I always run out of time with these. No, well, yeah, I, I just I, I'm fly it, so you're having fun. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it's after two. Gosh. It is after two. And I do want to remind people that you you have a three part or what you call three keys to success. So depending on who owns this, we do hope it could be the CEO or the CMO in harmony with the CEO to make sure that these things really are followed and we don't skip one of these critical success factors. That's right. And sometimes people think, well, process and systems, isn't that the same thing? Process is really how are you infusing it into the day to day, the week to week, the month to month, the year to year? You know, how is it showing up in your strategic plans? How is it show showing up in the ways that you're working in whatever you're pulsing throughout? And then systems is how you're measuring. So that's the distinction we make there. Understood. And, you know, one thing, again, that will probably poke and provoke people today is this whole area of how diversity and inclusion becomes an integral part of whatever your marketing or your business purpose is. Do you think there'll come a day where diversity inclusion does not need to be a separate department or has to be led by somebody and it becomes more the ethos of a given organization and how they treat people? Yes. I'm an inherently optimistic person, and I do believe that that day will come. I think it will take one to two generations to fully come. I have kids that are in their 20s and teens. Um, they do not see um, diversity as a separate thing, except to acknowledge all of the problems in the world. But in but in their day to day. You know, they um, they just see people as equal, and and by the way, love is love. So they, you know, no distinction. So I think as the next generation and the generation after comes up, it will help it become just more of a way of working. This is a little bit of a, um, a, a, a well, a very blunt analogy to make, but I but I do think about it kind of in my mind the way digital came about and how digital just you know still today but much less so people will talk about digital as a thing but primarily digital has just infused so when digital happened it was called new media right <laughs> i remember that. those days am i dating myself right and then it became I'm with you girl digital as like this separate thing 
And then, you know, lo and behold, step by step, it has become more infused. I think what is very powerful, Lisa, is that consumer expectation is very high now in what is expected from companies. Um, Ipsos did a recent survey during COVID and so did um, Edelman Trust Survey, if you're, if you're familiar with that. Yes, it's and a it, great survey. It's 70% and above where consumers are in terms of their expectation that companies will embrace and demonstrate diversity in all of their aspects. So if you're advertising and you're advertising and you're hiring and you know in all of your practices. So the sentiment is certainly far out front from where we are, but with it, those expectations being high, at the end of the day, business is going to be practical and you hope inspiring. So it's about doing right and doing good. And ultimately, if you get both of those right, that's how you're going to be most successful. So if your consumers are expecting it, companies are having to line up and that will help. But I think it's going to take a couple generations to really get us there. Yes. So what advice, and, and we could talk about this at length, and we we will revisit this a year from now and see hopefully that we've learned some things this year from all of our social ills and challenges. Talk to us here, people who may have had some fits and starts with their marketing purpose and want to re restart it. What's one thing they can do right away to make sure they get on the path? Yeah. So very practically speaking, and ideally not by yourself, but, you know, gather a couple of thinkers with you from your organization and sit on the Zoom for an hour and just ask the question, why do we exist as a business? Ask it, ask it again, ask it again, and then dig underneath the reasons. Have somebody um, capture all the different things, diverge, just, just go broad, as broad as possible, and then converge it down to where is that common ground, not lowest common den denominator, but common ground. What are we gelling around that is most powerful here that that most of us believe to be true or strive to make true? It sounds very like down and dirty, and it is, but but that's how you get at it. You have to bubble it up from what's in existence, because if you're just doing this top down, you know, we want to be X. That's, there's no there there. You have to bubble it up from what you know to be true. I also tell people if it's a hindrance in doing that, we run workshops all the time to help create brand positionings, brand purpose, and we have like a whole slew of questions we use. Sometimes you have to kind of get the negative out of the way. So you may want to also do an exercise around what do I wish weren't true about the organization to kind of get all that. Stuff. Yeah, and said that's it great, right. Nancy. I am a huge fan of Janusian thinking. Yeah, so it, it really helps trigger imagination and creativity. Well, well, we could go on forever. I hope people will not just get your book, Jack and Jill went up the hill. I hope people also go to Noetic Consultants and visit and learn more about some of the companies you've helped to shift into a purpose-driven organization. But we again run out of time. But thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, of course. For and I will here. tell you, um, on our site, we have a link to a brand diagnostic health tool that can be a great way. It takes maybe five minutes to take the survey. It's free. That can help you determine what your organization does need in this space. Great. And I'm putting your company name here so that people can find you. And that will be a lot easier. And we can't wait to welcome you back here next year, Nancy, to continue this conversation. Thanks so much for having me. Happy Friday, everybody. It's my pleasure. And I also want to remind people that this was our last live stream of the month and November just whizzed by. I'm not sure how that happened. And I do want to tell you that it's been a pleasure talking with you all about the power of purpose. So starting December 4th, we're going to shift gears. We're going to invite Amanda Satilli, my friend from Atlanta. She's the founder of Satilli Consulting and the author of some terrific books, uh, also a two-time author like myself. We're going to review together the winners and losers of 2020 and how you 
can find opportunity in any economy, pre-COVID, during COVID, or post-COVID. So for all of you in the United States, I want to, first of all, say, have a wonderful Thanksgiving in spite of some of the restrictions we're all facing. Um, write down the things for which you are grateful. Please wear your mask and be mindful that next year will definitely be much better and safer for all of our gatherings with loved ones. Thanks everybody.